हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट इन यू वाचिंग वेंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा If you're watching us from India, here's a question for you. Do you know about your fundamental rights? You learn about them in school and you enjoy them throughout your life, whether or not you can list all of them. We are talking about them tonight because India's Supreme Court has said that you have a right against climate change. You have a right to climate protection. And this is very significant and forward-looking because climate change is hurting our economy, our people and our country. And we need policymakers to come up with solutions and protections. Meanwhile in the Gaza war as the world rallies behind Palestinians their own leaders are fighting over power it's Hamas versus the Palestinian authority This holiday season if you plan to fly brace for chaos flight tickets are set to get more expensive and plane makers are dealing with falling parts Is India going to join the AUKUS military club why Elon Musk has lashed out at a Brazilian judge why Ecuador raided the Mexican embassy in Quito While El Salvador is offering 5000 free passports to foreigners while Germany is giving days off days to robots. And what's the life mantra for the oldest person alive on earth? Also why the solar eclipse is fueling memes and marketing gimmicks. All this and more coming up the headlines first. Myanmar's junta requests Thailand for permission to land flights there this is to evacuate their forces after rebels took control of a border town in recent months the conflict in Myanmar has escalated anti junta forces have made significant gains across the country Russia and Ukraine accuse each other of targeting the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant since 2022 Moscow has controlled the plant which is in southern Ukraine it is Europe's largest nuclear facility Pakistani Prime Minister meets Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. This is Shahbaz Sharif's first overseas visit after taking office since winning the election in February. Riyadh calls for dialogue between India and Pakistan, but New Delhi has repeatedly told Islamabad that talks and terror cannot go hand in hand. In India, the opposition Congress party files a complaint against Prime Minister Modi. Congress leaders meet with election commission officials. Prime Minister Modi had said that every page of the Congress manifesto reeks of breaking India. More than 90 people killed after a boat sinks off the coast of Mozambique. The makeshift ferry was overcrowded. Passengers were trying to escape from the mainland because of rumors of a cholera outbreak. And Hong Kong makes its largest ever gold smuggling bust, seizing 146 kilos at the city's international airport. The gold worth over 10 million dollars was disguised as machine parts in two air compressors. Hong Kong is one of the largest gold trade hubs in the world. Tonight I want to begin with a number 270 billion dollars If you were a country that lost 270 billion dollars because of one enemy what would you do Declare a war I'm guessing but that's not happening in this case these numbers are from India this loss was caused by climate change In 2022 India lost 8% of its GDP to climate change that's around 270 billion dollars and going forward it will be worse climate change is bleeding india so much so that now the country's top court has weighed in that's india supreme court it says indians need protection from climate change the court has delivered a landmark verdict linking climate change to fundamental rights and this is a big step forward not to mention very important India faces a lot of extreme weather events floods droughts heat waves and long periods of smog people tend to label these as acts of god and live with them but they should not have to india supreme court says this goes against our right to life a right guaranteed in the constitution of india so by extension we also have the right to a clean environment and we must get protection from climate change the court was hearing a matter related to an endangered bird And through this verdict it has expanded the scope of our fundamental rights. Now these are rights that every Indian is entitled to and they are guaranteed by the constitution, the right to speak freely and express opinion, the right to equality for all genders, the freedom to practice your religion and the ability to approach the courts and seek justice. We have all of this. Now climate change protections are part of this list.
The court has recognized the sweeping effects of climate change. Air pollution can make you sick. Droughts can hamper access to food and water. Floods and storms can uproot communities. And even if you feel that you're not directly affected by any of these events, it will eventually come to you. Because climate change also hurts the economy. Consider what's happening right now. An intense heat wave is sweeping most parts of the country. It is expected to last till June. And that's very bad news for Indians because half of our working population works outdoors. That's some 49% of Indian workers. More than 230 million people. They work outdoors in India. Can they survive this intense heat? The human body can operate best in temperatures below 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Anything beyond this is extreme heat, in which the human body may stop functioning optimally and lose its ability to deal with the heat. In the current heat wave, the mercury has already crossed 40 degrees in several parts of India. Add to that the fact that these people are working outdoors for long hours every day. This is testing the limits of human endurance. This poses a serious risk to health. So what are the governments doing? Well, they're issuing advisories for now. Multiple state governments have advised citizens to avoid the extreme heat. India's health ministry has done the same. They've issued a familiar list of do's and don'ts. Avoid going out in the afternoon. Avoid activity in the sun. Remain indoors until 4 p.m which is all very well. The problem is a lot of people cannot afford to do that, especially workers in the informal sector. They must keep working to feed their families. But going forward, even this may not be an option. Here's what the World Bank has said about heat waves. It says the world will lose 80 billion jobs by 2030, all because of heat waves, 80 million. And out of these, 34 million jobs will be in India. 34 million lost jobs. Meanwhile, the financial cost is already mounting. In 2021, India lost over $150 billion due to heat waves. This is across key sectors of the economy. India's central bank has also expressed concerns that the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India. In a recent report, the RBI said there is a direct link between climate change and inflation. Let me explain how. Number one, extreme weather events can impact agricultural production disrupt the flow of essential goods and, and cause prices to shoot up. Number two, extreme weather reduces the productivity levels of the workforce. And number three, climate-induced destruction can strain the finances of both households and businesses. So whichever way you look at it, climate change is hurting you. And we need policy intervention to protect people from it, which is why the order from India Supreme Court is welcome. It's a much-needed call to action. They say tragedies bring people together. Differences are forgotten, interests are put aside. All the focus is on helping the victims. But there is no such luck in Gaza. The Palestinian leadership is divided. It's Hamas versus the PA. That's the Palestinian Authority, PA. It's an unfortunate but expected story. The entire world is rallying for Gaza. Countries are working overtime to implement a ceasefire. Aid workers are risking their lives and protesters are marching against Israel. But what is Palestine's leadership doing? Fighting against each other. Instead of using this global attention, they are bickering for power. We're talking about two separate power centers here. Hamas controls Gaza, or at least they used to control Gaza. And the PA, the Palestinian Authority, rules over the West Bank. It is controlled by a party called Fateh, the party founded by Yasser Arafat, the Fateh party. They have very different ideologies, Fateh and Hamas. Hamas is a hardline Islamist group. The PA and its political parties are more secular. They prefer diplomacy over violence. And now these two groups are clashing. The first incident happened in late March. An aid convoy was passing through Rafah into Gaza. Six PA officials were, were part of this convoy, but Hamas arrested them. They accuse these men of being spies, of trying to sow division inside Gaza. But the PA has rejected this. They say the officials were simply overseeing aid work, no espionage, no meddling. But talk about priorities here. Israel is sweeping across the Gaza Strip and what does Hamas target? They're targeting officials from a fellow Palestinian group. The question is why? Both these groups have a history of rivalry. The Hamas emerged in the late 1980s during the first Palestinian uprising, also called the First Intifada. Hamas was not a fan of other Palestinian leaders. They considered them too liberal, too secular and too soft. 
So Hamas offered an alternative, a hardline violent fight for Palestine. This ideology found takers in the 2006 elections. The Fatah won in the West Bank, but Hamas won in Gaza. And this led to a minor civil war. Hamas eventually seized control of the Gaza Strip. Now, my point is quite simple here. Neither side likes the other. And the war has only deepened this hatred. There are questions on aid distribution, questions on reconstruction, questions on Gaza's political future. All of this has put the two sides against each other. The U.S. wants the PA to get involved, to play a major role in post-war Gaza, but Hamas does not like that. Their leaders say, there is no Gaza without us. And what about Israel? What does Benjamin Netanyahu think? Well, he doesn't want Hamas to stay on. After all, his war objective was to destroy Hamas. But he's not a fan of the PA either. And I'll tell you why. Let's assume that Hamas is defeated. Israel eventually leaves Gaza and the PA fills the political vacuum. What happens then? The PA could become more powerful. It would have complete control over the two Palestinian regions, which would make the PA more formidable. And Netanyahu would not like that. Which brings us to present day. Israel has signaled a climb down recently. First, they opened a border crossing with Gaza. Now they're pulling back soldiers. We do not have the exact numbers yet, but many Israeli soldiers have started leaving southern Gaza. Why is that? Listen to their defense minister's assessment. A Hamas. Hamas ceased to function as a military organization throughout the Gaza Strip. The troops go out and prepare for their follow-up missions. So Israel says Hamas has ceased to function as a military organization. It's not clear what that means, but it does put the focus on the future, on what happens after the war. The PA is better placed to make inroads. For starters, they're not designated terrorists. They are a political entity. Countries across the world recognize the Palestinian Authority. Even India does that. In 2018, Prime Minister Modi traveled to the West Bank. He held talks with the PA president. But Hamas is not like that. More than a dozen countries consider them terrorists. So the PA certainly holds an edge. What they need is more Western support. Only the US can force Israel to make concessions at this point. So the PA needs to woo Washington. And we are seeing indications of that. Last week, the Fatah party made a surprising statement. They accused Iran of trying to spread chaos in the West Bank. They promised to crack down on Tehran's meddling. I guess that statement will make Israel and the U.S. happy. But still, a lot needs to be done. The last elections in the West Bank were held in the year 2006. That's almost 18 years ago. An entire generation has grown up without seeing an election, without voting. Same goes for the president, Mahmoud Abbas. He's 88 years old and unpopular. Polls show 88% Palestinians want him to step down. He's one of the oldest world leaders alive. So first, the PA must put its own house in order and then focus on Gaza. A lot will also depend on Israel's military campaign. If Hamas is totally destroyed, the PA's entry will be easy. If Hamas survives, they will fight back. But whatever happens, I will say this. Palestinians deserve better. They need a strong, united and elected leadership. If not, none of this matters. Not the street protests, not the humanitarian aid, not the global support. Right now, the world is mourning with Palestinians. Public opinion is firmly with them. The least they, these leaders can do is repay that faith. Let's turn to India. We are slowly entering the holiday season here when schools will be shut and travel will begin. And a lot of Indians travel in the months of May and June during the school holidays. If you're one of them, then this story is for you. It's about airfares. One of India's biggest carriers has announced a cut in operations. That's Vistara. They have decided to reduce 10% of their flights. Around 25 to 30 flights per day will be reduced. And how will this impact you? It's a simple demand and supply equation. Fewer flights equals higher prices. So your tickets may cost a bit more than usual. But why is Vistara doing this? Well, a couple of reasons. First, an alleged pilot rebellion. Vistara had decided to expand operations in February, but they did so without hiring more pilots. So the existing ones were overworked. Many flights were delayed or cancelled. Pilots also complained of sudden roster changes. So Vistara realized its mistake. It is now going back to the February levels of operation. Another reason is the merger. Vistara is owned by the Tata Group. They also bought Air India back in 2022. Now the company wants to merge these two carriers, Air India and Vistara. 
They introduced a new pay structure at Air India. The same one is being extended to Vistara, but reports say the pilots do not like it because the new structure will reduce their salary. So what did they do? Many of them called in sick together, sort of like a protest. Many pilots are yet to accept the new salary, so executives at Air India have called for a meeting. They will hold talks with the pilots tomorrow. We should have more clarity by then. And if there is no resolution, what happens then? Then it could be more trouble. Just look at the period between March 31st and April 3rd. Vistara had to cancel 150 flights, plus 200 of them were delayed. So the company is now hitting pause. It is also looking to source pilots from Air India, basically put Air India pilots inside Vistara planes. Again, just one problem. This will take time. Rules require pilots to be trained on new carriers. That could take around 40 days. Which brings us back to the airline market. Carriers are not the only ones in trouble. Plane makers are in trouble too. I'm talking about aviation's problem child, Boeing. It's been a horrible year for Boeing. We've seen doors flying off, takeoffs being aborted, planes dropping midair, and now engine covers blowing off. A Boeing 737 was flying from Denver to Houston. Look at what happened during the takeoff. One hundred and forty one people were on board. Thankfully, all of them are safe. The aircraft rose to a height of 10,000 feet. But within 20 minutes, it landed back. No damages, no injuries, except for Boeing's brand, of course. That has taken a beating. U.S. officials have now opened another investigation. By now, they should have a special wing, a Boeing investigation team. But how will these setbacks affect the consumer? Again, it's about supply. Boeing's troubles have affected their output, especially of this jet, the 737 MAX. American regulators have put a cap on its production. Boeing can only make 38 MAX jets per month. And how many are they actually making? Far fewer. Production was in single digits in the month of March. And now this is a problem for Indian carriers too. Many of them have placed orders for the 737 MAX. Akasa Air has bought 150 of them. Air India has bought 190 of them. But at this rate, what if delivery is delayed? What if the plane gets grounded? We are already seeing some worrying signs. In February, Boeing said it was reworking 50 undelivered planes. They found some quality glitch. So more work had to be done. As a result, delivery has been pushed back. Some carriers have been affected by such delays. For example, United Airlines, they're asking pilots to take time off next month. Why? Because there are no planes to fly. United was expecting new aircraft from Boeing this summer, but the delivery has been delayed, so the pilots have no planes to fly. Could the same happen to Indian carriers? Boeing was asked about this. They said no meaningful delays are expected, whatever that means. But for customers, the message is quite clear. We are entering a period of churn. We have a number of factors often pulling in different directions. You have technological issues. You have supply chain issues, safety concerns, pilot concerns, and then, then of course, the rising demand. Take India, for example. India's air traffic is expected to reach 300 million by 2030. Do you know how much it is, it, it is right now? Around 153 million. So the number of travelers is doubling but the carriers and plane makers are not. If anything, both are shrinking. We can't bet on market forces to correct this. We need our policy makers and corporate titans to be proactive. Let me start the next story with a question. Are China and the US patching up? We ask because the US Treasury Secretary is in China, that's Janet Yellen, she says the relationship is on a quote-unquote more stable footing and that the US is not looking to decouple from China. But that we say is only half the story. Here's the other half. The US is expanding a nuclear alliance against China. I'm talking about AUKUS. That's a military club with three members, Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States. Hence the name AUKUS or AUKUS. 
Now they're looking to bring in more members. A lot of names are being thrown around like Japan. The US is said to be pushing for Japan's inclusion. Others on the list are Canada, New Zealand and South Korea. Apparently they all want to join AUKUS and they have expressed interest, which makes you wonder what will they call themselves? It may look something like, like this. Not sure how to pronounce this, but jokes aside, why do the original members want an expansion? They're hoping more allies will deter China in the Indo-Pacific. Which brings us to the next question. Is India part of this conversation? Officially, there is no such communication, but the idea has been discussed and debated. When AUKUS was created, the US had ruled out an expansion. In fact, the White House had even laughed off the idea. AUKUS? What would it become? Jaukus? Uh, Jaukus? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Awkward AUKUS? I don't know. Something like that. Yeah. Look, I, I think, David, that um, the announcement of AUKUS last week was not meant to be an indication. And I think this is a message the president also sent to uh, his uh, to Macron uh, that there's no one else who will be involved in security in the Indo-Pacific. But that was some three years ago. They seem to have had a change of heart since. Last year, the idea of expanding the alliance gained momentum. The UK made a pitch for India. In 2023, British lawmakers backed India's inclusion in AUKUS. More reports added to the speculation, like this one. It says Indian officials and AUKUS nations met. They had informal talks on emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, electronic warfare and cyber tech. Reports say AUKUS nations wanted to work with India on all these fronts. And the latest reports and expansion plans also talk uh, along similar themes. They're calling it Pillar 2, the second pillar of the AUKUS alliance, under which current members will strike deals with new members. Together, they, they will develop advanced military technologies in areas like artificial intelligence, hypersonic missiles, and quantum technologies. Now, adding India to this mix could open up new possibilities. It could make the alliance more inclusive. Because as of today, Australia is the only Indo-Pacific member in this group. But can AUKUS convince India to join? It'll be tricky. Traditionally, New Delhi has shied away from joining any military bloc or alliance. India prefers to exercise its strategic autonomy. Plus, how will joining AUKUS help New Delhi? AUKUS was born not as a military alliance, but out of a submarine deal. Australia is buying a fleet of eight nuclear submarines. The British are designing the submarine. The Americans are supplying the technology. This is the foundation of AUKUS. And when will Australia get the subs? In the next decade. The first three submarines will arrive only in the 2030s. What about the rest? The plan is to build them in Adelaide in the 2040s. So no submarine, at least for the next six years. And the new members will be kept out of this submarine agreement altogether. In 2021, AUKUS was sold as a defining military pact. But in terms of deliverables, it has not accomplished anything so far. Meanwhile, China is tracking these developments closely. It is warning against AUKUS expansion. The United States, the United Kingdom and Australia have ignored the widespread concerns from the countries in the region and the international community about the risk of nuclear proliferation. They have continuously sent signals of expanding the so-called trilateral security partnership and have even attempted to lure some countries to join them. It will intensify the arms race in the Asia-Pacific region and undermine regional peace and stability. China is gravely concerned about this. Whether India chooses to join AUKUS or not, it still has avenues to cooperate individually with its members. India regularly engages with the militaries of AUKUS members in joint drills. Plus, countries like the US have a record of sharing military intelligence about China with India. So, to collaborate with AUKUS, New Delhi doesn't really need to be a member. Elon Musk has picked a new fight. He's taking on a Supreme Court justice, not of his country though, a judge in Brazil. Now usually we explain a story first, then we get to the reactions. But here, the reaction is the story. Let me show you what Elon Musk is saying. And I'm quoting. This judge has brazenly and repeatedly betrayed the constitution and people of Brazil. He should resign or be impeached. Shame. 
Now, just a reminder, Elon Musk is not a Brazilian citizen. He is not a world leader or a politician. He is a billionaire based in the US. And from there, he is calling for the impeachment of a judge in Brazil. He is calling the judge Brazil's Darth Vader. What explains this outrage? A crackdown by Brazil's Supreme Court. The judge in question is Alexandre de Moraes. He is investigating far-right social media accounts, specifically their role in the 2022 elections. Now, you may remember what happened then. Lula da Silva defeated Jair Bolsonaro in the election in Brazil, but thousands of Bolsonaro supporters stormed the capital. They raided government buildings. It was a low-key coup attempt. So the judge now says, time to face the music. He decided to ban these far-right accounts on X. He also threatened the company with consequences. If you don't ban, you will be fined. How much? Almost $19,000 per day. Do you know what Elon Musk is doing? He's taking the fine. Musk has lifted the ban on these accounts. He says this is aggressive censorship. He also says he will reveal the details of the judge's order. You're talking about open contempt. The judge has ordered a probe against Elon Musk. Chances are there will be consequences. At best, more fines. At worst, a full shutdown of X in Brazil. And Musk is preparing for this. He is asking users to download VPNs on their devices. Now, VPNs are virtual private networks. Say a website or platform is banned in your country, you can use a VPN to access it. So Elon Musk is in full rebellion against Brazil's Supreme Court. Now, I know this issue is divisive. A lot of people are against banning accounts, even those linked to far-right groups. But this issue is not about freedom of speech. It's about rule of law. We have courts for a reason. We have governments and jurisdictions for a reason. You, you can't just decide to ignore that. Musk is free to challenge the court's order. He can seek other legal remedies, but he cannot defy a Supreme Court order. Would he dare do this against a U.S. Supreme Court judge? It's unlikely. But in Brazil, he's more than happy to. And it may be another country tomorrow. Now, we don't know where this story will go. But one thing is clear. Governments need to look closely at Elon Musk, at the power that he holds. Just consider his internet company, Starlink. Starlink has more than 4,500 satellites in orbit. That's more than half of all active satellites. So Elon Musk alone has more satellites than entire countries have. And he's using them to shape wars. Ukraine is using Starlink to operate its military. Most of their drones use Elon Musk's network. Do you see why that's a problem? In one blow, Musk can cripple Ukraine's war effort. We saw a sneak peek of that last year. Ukraine was planning to attack Russian ships in Crimea when Elon Musk got to know he shut down Starlink. So Kiev's drones never hit the target. Instead, they washed up on the shores of Crimea. This is too much power for one person, and it's not just satellites. Look at his other companies and investments. Tesla makes up 20% of the global EV market. In five electric car, if five electric cars are sold, one of them is a Tesla, anywhere in the world. In the US, its market share is even high. It's almost 56%. Then you have SpaceX. They carried out 98 launches in 2023. Compare that, compare that to, to national space agencies. ISRO had seven launches in 2023. The Indian Space Agency, ISRO. China had 67. So SpaceX is launching more vehicles than entire countries. And finally, you have X, one of the most popular social media platforms in the world. X has around 550 million active users every month. It has the potential to shape the future. Propaganda wars are fought on X. Fake news is spread on X. Hate speech can be amplified on X. And world leaders make announcements on X. That's a lot of power for one platform. And by extension, for one man which is why governments need to figure something out. Elon Musk is not your hands-off businessman. He's deeply invested in his ventures. He pushes his opinions on his services. And that can be a recipe for disaster. Now to Mexico, which has cut diplomatic ties with Ecuador. This is after police raided the Mexican embassy in Quito. And what was the raid for? to arrest former Ecuadorian Vice President Jorge Glass. He was seeking refuge there. Mexico had offered him political asylum, which, he did not, which did not go down well with Ecuador, so they raided the embassy to arrest him. The move has led to outrage across the region and the globe.
Embassies are inviolable sovereign territories. Raids on diplomatic premises are unheard of. It's a red line that countries do not cross, which is why this one is a big deal. Our next report tells you about the diplomatic repercussions that Ecuador could face. The year was 2012. Julian Assange was a wanted man. Human rights system. The WikiLeaks founder was seeking asylum, so he was hauled up at the Ecuadorian embassy in London. The UK threatened to raid the embassy. Of course, they did not go ahead with it. But Ecuador was up in arms. They said any raid would be a breach of international law. It would violate the Vienna Convention. Last Friday, Ecuador violated the same Vienna Convention by raiding the Mexican embassy in its capital. What was the raid for? It was to capture this man, former Ecuadorian Vice President Jorge Glass. Glass was Vice President from 2013 to 2018. Last year, he was sentenced to six years in jail. This was due to corruption claims. He was released from prison in November, but Ecuador issued another warrant. So Glass sought refuge in the Mexican embassy. On Friday, Mexico granted him political asylum. Ecuador viewed the action as illegal. So the police raided the Mexican embassy in Quito. Special forces surrounded the embassy. Agents scaled the walls. Mexico says the head of mission tried to prevent the invasion, but he was pushed to the ground. Glass was captured. He has now been transferred to a high-security prison. Of course, the move did not go down well with Mexico. Embassies are considered as inviolable sovereign territory. This is according to the Vienna Convention, a treaty governing international relations. It states that a country cannot intrude upon an embassy on its territory. Abiding by these rules is seen as sacrosanct. It's a red line countries rarely cross. However, it is not the only rule Ecuador broke. It also violated a regional agreement known as the 1954 Convention on Diplomatic Asylum. This allows individuals to seek asylum in embassies. But Quito argues otherwise. It says Mexico interfered in its internal affairs. By receiving Mr. Glass, the Mexican embassy prevented him from reporting to the judicial authorities on a weekly basis. In doing so, they interfered with Ecuador's democratic institutions in clear violation of the fundamental principle of non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries. The move has led to a diplomatic storm across the region and the world. Mexico was quick to sever ties with Ecuador. President Obrador called it a violation of Mexico's sovereignty. It pulled its diplomatic personnel from the country. Nicaragua followed suit. Rebukes poured in from the entire region. All governments across political spectrums slammed it. The US condemned the violation of the Vienna Convention. The United Nations said it was alarmed by the raid. Mexico plans to take its case to the ICJ. That's the International Court of Justice. Of course, Ecuador will argue that Mexico sheltered a prisoner, but it is unlikely that the court will rule against Quito. The punishment could include a fine or removal of Ecuador from multilateral organizations. Either way, this diplomatic storm is far from over. For our next story, let's talk about Naib Bukele. He is the president of El Salvador. He calls himself the world's coolest dictator. Since coming to power, he has made some radical moves. He ended gang violence in his country. He wants to build a Bitcoin city. And now he has a new plan. It's about attracting foreign talent. How will he do it? By giving them free passports. It's a $5 billion project. Here's how it will work. El Salvador will offer a total of 5,000 passports. This will be for highly skilled foreign workers like scientists, engineers, doctors, artists and philosophers. The government of El Salvador will help these people relocate. They will eliminate taxes and pay for all costs involved in shifting. Entire families will be accommodated. Their assets will be taken care of. And once these people move to El Salvador, bag and baggage, they will become citizens. They will have all the rights of a citizen including the right to vote in elections. Basically, it's an all-inclusive package, everything paid for. 
And what does El Salvador get in return? Bukele says there's great economic gain here. He looks at these people as assets. When they come to El Salvador, they will contribute to the economy and help in the country's growth. At least that's the hope. But could they also pose some problems? The president does not think so. He says only 5,000 passports are being offered, which is only 0.1% of his country's population, which is a very small number. Yet an ambitious plan here. The big question is, will it work? Because importing talent is not a new idea. Countries do it all the time. They offer perks, better economic opportunities, a better standard of living. And El Salvador is now trying to do the same. But is this country on anyone's radar? This is El Salvador on the map, the smallest country in Central America, also the most densely populated. In the 1980s, it was rocked by a civil war. At least 70,000 people died. But that wasn't the end of violence. Until recently, gangs ruled the streets. People died daily. El Salvador had a very high murder rate, the highest in the whole of Latin America. Reports say people were scared to leave their homes. And when they did leave, they left the country altogether. That changed with Bukele's election. He cracked down on crime. He went after gangs and put thousands of them in jail. Some of his measures were draconian, but they brought down the crime rate and shot up his popularity. He recently won a second term in office. And now he wants to attract talent, make El Salvador great again. Won't be easy. Standing in the way of his lofty goals, is his country's economy. He inherited a bad economy. The gangs that ravaged the country also extorted money. At one, one point, they're said to have taken close to 3% of the GDP. Now, while the gangs have been tackled, the economy has not blossomed. Growth is still stagnant. It's the slowest in all of Central America. Poverty has doubled in the last five years. Half the population lives with food insecurity. The other half is worried about rising costs. In 2022, the country's public debt had reached $25 billion, which is the highest in 30 years, and state coffers are running low. It brings us to Bukele's ambitious plans. First, it was Bitcoin. He tried to make his country a crypto haven. In 2019, he brought a migration law to expedite citizenship for those who donated Bitcoin. It didn't work. So now Bukele has changed tack. He's offering perks to import talent. We'll keep you posted on how this one turns out. Our next story is about yesterday, Sunday. Who doesn't love a Sunday? It's a synonym for a holiday for many. Sunday is a day off in most countries. But in Germany, it is sacred. So much so that German law protects it. You can't work on a Sunday in Germany, even if you're a robot. You heard that right. Robots too get Sundays off in Germany. That is the law. And it's forcing automated shops to shut down. Our next report tells you why. Sundays, they are a sacred affair in Germany. In fact, Germans love their Sunday so much that they enshrined it in law. It's called Sonntagsruhe Sunday Rest and it's protected by the German constitution. But the protection doesn't just apply to humans. It extends to robots too. On Sundays, they get a day off in Germany. This was decided by a court order. It started with the supermarket chain Tegut. They run automated stores in Germany. It's basically like a big vending machine. You go in, grab your stuff and check out. Everything is automated. There are no human workers. But that hasn't excluded the store from the Sunday rest law. The case was brought by service sector union Verdi. It staunchly opposes Sunday shopping. The union says workers, human or otherwise, need guaranteed time off. Of course, the verdict has not gone down well with Tegut and some shoppers. Most shops are closed in Germany. There are very few choices. That's where Tegut comes in. They say its shops have no human workers, so technically it doesn't violate the principle. Its sales are also the highest on the weekend. So why then is Germany adamant on protecting the rights of robots? Well, it's not so much about robots as it is about the concept of Sunday rest. If Tegut is allowed to be open, it will allow other stores to reconsider. This may derail the concept of Sundays. It may not be a new one in Germany. It's a debate that's in the news from time to time. Should it be allowed? Should it be banned? For starters, the law has strong religious influence. 
Sunday is the day Christians attend church. 50% of Germany's population identify as Christians, but nearly 43.8% have no religious inclinations. Does that still make this law relevant then? Well, Germany has given the choice to individual states now. Each of Germany's 16 states can choose its own exceptions. Some have, in fact, allowed automated stores. But the state Tegut operates in doesn't allow it yet. It's likely that the law will stay for now. Many believe Germany's rules need to move with the times. But for now, it will give its robots a day off work, needed or not. After all, in the words of Goethe, rest if you must, but don't you quit, even if you're made of steel. Nineteen hundred twelve was a long time ago. That's when the Titanic set sail. It sunk a few days later. But this was the same year when a British man was born, John Alfred Tinniswood. And unlike the British Ocean Liner, he is still alive. Tinniswood is 111 years and 226 days old. He has lived through two world wars, the great influenza and COVID-19 pandemics, the birth of his great grandchildren, and now he has broken a Guinea's world record. Tinniswood has become the world's oldest man alive. At this point, some of you may be wondering, what is his secret to a long life? Well, he does not smoke, he rarely drinks, and he eats fish and chips every, once every week. But before you start ordering French fries, let me clarify, this is not his real secret, so to speak. It is this, moderation. In other words, a balanced life. Tinniswood says, if you do too much of anything, you're going to suffer eventually. This is a strong dose of Monday motivation. But before we go on, here's something else that he said. He doesn't feel particularly special about having lived this long. He says at the end of the day, the length of one's life is just based on luck. You either live long or you live short. And you can't do much about it. And that's probably true. So his advice is not just for a long life, but for a better life. And his idea is quite simple. Moderation is the key to a better quality of life. And this could mean a lot of things. Moderation in food, balance in diet, sustainability in lifestyle, contentment at work. Basically not perfect and not too much, but just enough. That's the master plan for happiness. To some of you, it may sound underwhelming. After all, moderation has never been cool. We love fitness boot camps, not sustainable weekly gym regimes. We push ourselves to the breaking point at work. And the odd emergency is okay, but it cannot become the norm. You cannot always live in the extremes. When you do, there's burnout, there's stress, even failure, and that is counterproductive. So moderation is important. And it comes with a long list of benefits. Lesser stress, better emotional and physical health, higher productivity, and healthier relationships. Many countries and cultures encourage this, which is why some nations with the best work-life balance are also the happiest in the world. For centuries, countries like India have fostered this idea. India has fostered santulan or balance. Ancient Indian arts of yoga and Ayurveda, they aim to integrate the body and the mind. Meanwhile, the Spanish have their siestas to balance work with rest. And the Swedish have an ethos of largum. It means not too much, not too little, just right. It applies to everything. Most from Swedish coffee and candy to work and clothing. Largam is the idea of things being sufficient just as they are, which does not mean that you become complacent or stop studying for exams because a D minus is good enough. It simply means that if you score an A instead of an A plus, don't beat yourself too much. So Largam is about contentment, about restoring balance. And if it seems tough, Know that balance is already on your mind. Quite literally, when you're walking or sitting at your desk, your brain knows that you need balance. It automatically sends nerve signals to your body. They help you recenter yourself. So my point is quite simple. Striving for balance is both natural and beneficial. But that too requires a balanced approach. And if this feels too complicated, just remember what Oscar Wilde once said. Everything in moderation, especially moderation. Our last story tonight comes from North America, parts of the US, Canada and Mexico where millions of people are tilting their heads skyward. They're marveling at the 
the total solar eclipse, when the moon crosses the sun and blocks its light, turning day into night for a few moments. This creates a celestial spectacle. But that is not the only common experience it has fueled. There are memes, marketing gimmicks, myths, and even conspiracy theories. Here's a report. Today was the day after a nearly seven-year wait. The total solar eclipse was finally here. What's that? This phenomenon occurs when the moon moves in front of the sun and blocks it completely. So the bright sky darkens to twilight in just seconds. For a few fleeting moments, millions witnessed the celestial spectacle. People got their telescopes ready, grabbed their vision goggles and travelled to witness this phenomenon. It's absolutely uh, packed with uh, tourists here for the eclipse. And it's so uh, it's wonderful. We're going to have a good time. So who all got to see the eclipse? Well, more than 30 million people spread over a large chunk of the continental US, along with parts of Mexico and Canada. Many Americans who didn't fall in the path of the eclipse were disappointed. Those with FOMO or the fear of missing out suffered the most. And this map of NOPE didn't help matters. Even so, people were excited. So Donald Trump made a comeback, for now only in memes. The last solar eclipse took place in 2017. That's when Trump was the US president. He had a little eclipse viewing party and squinted towards the skies without protective gear. Maybe it's his disregard for science, but no matter the reason, Trump became both a meme and a cautionary tale. Because he may have done it, you please don't. If you want to peek at the eclipse, wear safety glasses or the solar rays can cause serious eye injury. But more than memes, like most things, the eclipse has fueled capitalism with new marketing campaigns in the event's honour and a newfound sense of hope for tired astrology content. Social media stargazers are talking about eclipse energy. According to some, apparently cats are feeling particularly chaotic. Now, if you've watched cat content, you would know that cats and chaos go hand in hand. But many are worried about this so-called energy. As absurd as this is, if you hear what the ancestors had to say, this may not sound as outrageous. For generations and across cultures, many myths have been attached to the solar eclipse. In Vietnam, people believed that a solar eclipse was caused by a giant frog devouring the sun. According to ancient Hindu mythology, a deity is beheaded and his head flies off into the sky, then swallows the sun, causing an eclipse. Meanwhile, the ancient Greeks believed that a solar eclipse was a sign of angry gods, the beginning of disasters and destruction. These myths have obviously been debunked. People rarely believe in them. But that doesn't reduce the unease. After all, the Friday before the eclipse, a 4.8 magnitude earthquake shook parts of America, including New York, Pennsylvania and New Jersey. To some doomers, this seemed like major eclipse energy. Had this happened two centuries ago, it could have unleashed at least one witch hunt. But today, it's only led to memes. And that's definitely some progress. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Istanbul, millions of tulips bloom across the city, marking the arrival of spring. In Italy, Mount Etna blows volcanic vortex rings into the sky. And the UAE launches a project to transform the city in a city into a canvas with murals. Finally, we're taking you back in history on this day in 1929. Indian revolutionaries Bhagat Singh and Batukeshwar Dutt hurled bombs inside the Central Assembly in Delhi. Their actions rallied public opinion and challenged British rule in India. After throwing the bombs, neither man fled the scene. These freedom fighters courted arrest and were sentenced to life in prison. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.
2001, Al-Qaeda had hit the Twin Towers in America. Washington was out for revenge. They knew the mastermind Osama bin Laden was in Afghanistan. They also knew the Taliban wouldn't cooperate. So the US decided it's time for war. Just one problem though. Afghanistan was quite far away. Getting jets and bombers there would be a task. The US military settled on these planes, the B-2 bombers. They took off from an Air Force base in Missouri. They would fly across the Pacific to Afghanistan. These planes would kick off America's war. But to reach there, the planes had to refuel. First in California, then in Hawaii, then in Guam, then over the Malacca Strait, and finally in a small Indian Ocean island, the island of Diego Garcia. It became the home base for these bombers. They would drop their load in Afghanistan, return to Diego Garcia, refuel their planes, and then head out for another bombing. This island was crucial to America's war. Some veterans call it the unsinkable carrier. Others call it the island of shame. Because this island's history is steeped in injustices. From colonization to expulsion to occupation, it's the story of how the US and Britain illegally hold on to a foreign island. But how did they get it in the first place? And who does Diego Garcia really belong to? Time for a flashback. Diego Garcia is located in the Indian Ocean, just south of the equator. To its north is the Maldives, to the west is Seychelles, and to the southwest is Mauritius. So it's a very important piece of land. And Diego Garcia isn't an isolated island. It is part of the Chagos Archipelago, one of 60 islands in total. The belief is it was used by Indian and Arab traders. They would sail the Indian Ocean frequently, so Diego Garcia became a pit stop, a place to relax and refresh. Then in the 16th century, it was discovered by Europeans, by this Portuguese sailor. His name was Pedro Mascarenhas. In 1532, he was sailing to the coast of India. That's when he stumbled upon this island. He named it after a Portuguese admiral, Don Garcia de Noronha. Traders knew Diego Garcia was important, but its strategic advantage was not clear yet. That would happen during the colonial race. For most of its history, Diego Garcia was a dependency of Mauritius. So whoever controlled Mauritius controlled Diego Garcia. It changed hands many times. The Dutch came in 1598, the French took over in the early 1700s, and the British in 1810. Among them, the French kicked off settlements. A slave owner in Mauritius was first of the block. His name was Pierre-Marie Lanormand. He noticed a problem among his many slaves. Leprosy was spreading. So he submitted a petition to the French governor of Mauritius. He wanted a settlement in Diego Garcia. He would turn part of the island into a quarantine zone. The rest he would cultivate. In 1783, the French gave permission. La Normand traveled to Diego Garcia with 22 slaves. They found the tropical weather perfect, so they set about developing the island. You soon had fisheries, coconut plantations and cotton cultivation. By 1794, the island was producing its own coconut oil, but then came war. Britain captured Mauritius from France. The Treaty of Paris confirmed British rule over the region, so Diego Garcia switched hands too. At first, nothing changed. The island kept producing plenty of coconut oil, enough to satisfy half of Mauritius. But in the late stages of the 19th century, a big change happened. Steamships entered the picture. Ships that used coal to sail, many of these shipping companies were British. They realized Diego Garcia could be of help. It was located in the middle of the Indian Ocean, so why not turn it into a fueling station? Or as it was called then, a coaling station. The Orient Steam Navigation Company took the lead. They set up Diego Garcia's first coaling station. Soon another company followed, so the island became quite busy. It was blessed with a very large base, so accommodating ships was not a problem, and thus the island flourished. The residents led a simple but content life. They harvested coconuts, worked at the coaling stations, and made a decent amount of money. Around 90% of the population was Roman Catholic. Bishops from Mauritius would send missionaries to Diego Garcia, so the locals had no reason to leave. Until they were made to. The 20th century was a period of churn and Diego Garcia got the worst of it. After the Second World War, Britain lost its Asian colonies and Mauritius was among them. 
1968, the country became independent. Mauritius became independent in 1968, but Britain had been busy behind the scenes. Before granting independence, they issued a new order. Some outlying regions of Mauritius were taken away. They were declared as the British Indian Ocean Territory. And among them was Diego Garcia. Why did Britain do this? Why did they carve up Mauritian land? Some would say, well, that's what they do. But here a bigger game was at play. The 1960s was the second decade of the Cold War. Both the West and the Soviets eyed a big prize, oil. Most of the oil was produced in West Asia. So you needed the Indian Ocean to get that oil out, to ship it across the world. Again, one problem. The West was losing its Indian Ocean presence. By 1956, Britain had been kicked out of Egypt. At the same time, the Soviets were making inroads. There was talk of a Soviet Indian Ocean fleet. So the US wanted a base in the region and Britain obliged. In 1966, they struck a secret deal with the US. Diego Garcia could be used for defense purposes. Again, just one problem. What would happen to the people there? Hundreds of people lived on Diego Garcia. Where would they go? Britain had an answer for that too. Simply remove them. They'd already separated Diego Garcia from Mauritius, so now they told the locals to leave, go to Mauritius or Seychelles. Of course, the islanders refused to do that. Many of them had built their lives in Diego Garcia. It was their homeland. So why would they leave? That's when Britain and the US applied pressure. Forceful expulsion began. Islanders would often leave for treatment or shopping or a holiday, but they were not allowed to return. Also, the number of supply ships was reduced. You see, Diego Garcia was not self-sufficient. It needed food and medicine from the outside, and most of this was shipped in regularly. But Britain and the US reduced these shipments to choke Diego Garcia, so the people there had no option but to leave. By 1973, Diego Garcia was empty. No resident was left on the island. It became a drawing board for the US military. Many of the islanders fled to Mauritius. A few also left for Seychelles and Britain. There they lived as second-class citizens. Britain promised to compensate Mauritius for the loss of territory, but the payments were late and hardly enough. These moves did trigger a lot of outrage, especially among the Indian Ocean countries. The likes of Sri Lanka and later Seychelles opposed it. They said, do not militarize our neighborhood. But the big players did not listen. By the 1980s, Diego Garcia became a full-fledged US military base. And the islanders still fighting for justice. In the 1990s, they filed a lawsuit in Britain. They said, we have been illegally displaced. Please let us return home. And in the year 2000, the court agreed. It said Britain's decision to relocate the islanders was unlawful. Washington and London challenged it, this order. But they lost again in the Court of Appeals. So finally, they approached the House of Lords. Where the expected happened, the Lords rejected the islanders' demand. Though by now, the global sentiment had changed. So Britain expressed regret for its actions. It also granted citizenship to some expelled islanders but still no permission to return. In 2017, even the United Nations got involved. The General Assembly asked the World Court to sort out the matter. That's the ICJ, the International Court of Justice. And this court too sided with the islanders. Britain's colonization method was declared illegal and London was asked to return Diego Garcia to Mauritius. But spoiler alert, they did not. The court's order was not even binding, it was simply advisory in nature, so Diego Garcia remains in British hands. Some 4,000 US and British soldiers lounge on this island, meanwhile its rightful owners remain exiled. They have reluctantly built new lives abroad, thousands of them live in Britain. They've kept their story alive through music and theatre, but is there any hope of them returning home? Not from the looks of it. Mauritius is still asking Britain to return Diego Garcia in exchange. They're promising to allow the US base. Even public opinion is with them. Earlier, British postal stamps were used in the region, but in 2021, the United Nations banned it. They said, use Mauritian stamps instead. Another brave move came the next year. In 2022, a Mauritian diplomat raised his national flag on Chagos Islands. 
And his justification was simple. The British raised flags to claim colonies. He is doing it to reclaim his land. But Mauritius has a long fight ahead. With China now sailing the Indian Ocean, the US and the UK won't give up easily. If anything, the island is more important today. The US and Britain may call Diego Garcia anything they want to. An unsinkable carrier or an island of strategic depth or an outpost in the Indian Ocean. But to history, it will always be a colonial injustice. An island of Western shame.